So just a summary of this, um, what M plus version 8 offers is two-level analysis with random intercept that can vary across subjects. I'm talking about factor analysis now. Random loadings that can vary across subjects using a bar statement for a set of slopes, f by y1 to y10. So the slopes are the loadings here. This existed already in version 7, but I have a feeling it's underutilized again. So much happened in version 7 five years ago that um, uh, that was perhaps too much. We didn't have time to read, write enough application papers on it. But it, there's an article, a chapter here, and you have the reference at the end. And Sean Paul Fox, is that another Dutch? Another Sorry, Dutch? Yes. Okay. A very good researcher, too. It's a book on Bayesian analysis of IRT where he talks about these random measurement parameters. Cross classified analysis, random intercept can vary across time, so, sorry, vary across subjects and time. Random loadings can vary across subjects only, not time yet. Version 7.4 had cross classified analysis with random intercept and loadings, but it did not have autocorrelation, which is needed for intensive longitudinal data. So, and that cross-classified analysis needed many time points, but when you have many time points, they're often closely spaced in time, and therefore, you need the autocorrelation. So, we almost had it, but not quite, which was pointed out to us by Jean-Paul Lawrence, so, which sits over there, so it's, he has had a hand in this. For an example of random loadings varying across subjects, see uh, the user's guide 9.40, the last example, last part. All right. Subject-specific reliability comes into play also, not only subject-specific measurements. And um, uh, intercept and loadings varying, factor variance and residual variance varying across subjects and time, implies the reli reliability of test scores vary across subject and time. Uh, this is an article that touched on that. We're not, not, not going to focus on that slide. We're going to take it easy instead and talk about a final example which uh, moves us beyond the smoking data but keeps us in the realm of negative affect. The irritability matters. And uh, we're going to do a factor analysis of the uh, negative affect items. And they are, there are 10 of them. We're going to call it item factor analysis or item response modeling, item response theory modeling, uh, one and the same thing to me. Uh, so we're going to assume that there's one factor here. There probably are more than one factor behind negative affect, but although we don't quite have the right tools to assess that quite yet. The data come from uh, a Notre Dame study by Cindy Bergerman, uh, where you have 270 people and 56 time points, daily measures on consecutive days. And that was uh, described in an article in Psychological Methods by Wang and somebody called Hamaker and Bergman in 2012. So uh, that, one, that article was a real inspiration to me because it really stressed uh, what the important parameters are that we should let vary across subjects. The, Primary three, three, intercept, fee, and variance. Those are the three important ones. That trio, they had that done there. And for these data. So the predictors and distal outcomes of negative affect development over the 56 days was their concern. So they had this mediation situation that I showed, you know, the uh, female and age influencing the random effects, the random effects influencing the distal quit outcome. It's mediation on the between level, and for those of you who were here yesterday, it has a binary outcome and multiple mediators that are latent. That calls for counterfactually defined effects, which can be done by the techniques we learned yesterday, at least through model constraint, to get the right indirect and direct effect for that quit probability on the between level of a time series analysis that's multi-level. Anyway, back to this story. Ten negative affect items. Each item is on a five category scale. Uh, and the items have to do with being afraid, ashamed, guilty, hostile, scared, upset, irritable, jittery, nervous, distressed. The average score was used in the article. 
Now, you can certainly do a wide format analysis for 56 time points, single wide format analysis, but um, so t is 56, but you have 10 variables for each time point, so that would be 560 variables. That's a little wide. Big covariance matrices, heavy computations. Instead, we're going to take a uh, two-level uh, analysis, uh, or perhaps a cross-classified analysis. We'll see on the next slide. Just a reminder, the question format is, today I felt afraid. Today I felt irritable. Not at all to five, which is one to five, which is extremely. We're going to take a one-factor DAFS model approach to this. Here is the distribution of the variable in the Bergman data. This is the average score. Looks like this. Strongly skewed. Uh, very high piling up, strong floor effect, 55%, floor value 1, which is saying Today I felt not at all any of those tied 10 items. So these are people who didn't have any negative affect at all. Here's a typical item distribution. This is the average. Here's for the item, you know, with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 scale scores. 66% at the lowest value. And this is for the uh, seemingly co common item of irritability. Who isn't irritated at some point? You know, but still, 66% say they were not at all. So what do you do with data like this? Well, maybe this is continuous censored, uh, but um, it's not a great candidate for censored, mostly because um, the, uh, this distribution here in the tail doesn't come down towards zero before, to, to the right of the pile at the floor value. So maybe a better approach is to not work with the average, but go down to the item level and model this instead. And as I said yesterday morning, if you take a categorical variable approach, treat this as an ordinal variable, there is no violation of assumptions uh, by having a pile, very high pile, very strong floor effect here. That doesn't violate any assumptions of the ordinal logistic regression or probability regression approach. <clears throat> so the ordered categorical item modeling, which in statistics is called proportional odds modeling, and in IRT is called graded response modeling, uh, the outcome Y looks like this, like we just saw, but the way it's modeled is through a continuous latent response variable Y star, which has response categories uh, demarked by thresholds here, tau 1, tau being the threshold, tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, tau 4. And the fact that these thresholds are towards the right of the tail means that you have a very low probability of being down here, corresponding to the high pile here, and very small probability in between the thresholds up here, corresponding to small piles of Y up there. So I'm saying that despite you have a non-normal Y, truly non-normal, we can have normality of the Y star behind each item, latent response variable, and we can have normality of any factors in the model, and we can have normality of the between level random effects. Actually, these uh, normality assumptions for the random effects is, is a topic uh, that's been under study by uh, Morton Schultzberg and uh, Ellen Hamacher, and Morton is going to describe that in part seven tomorrow after lunch, what he's found so far. Here's the input, and we do cross classified factor analysis more general than the uh, two-level factor analysis. One factor, 10 ordinal negative affect items. So we declare the 10 items as categorical. And we have two cluster variables, subjects and day, for these diary data. And we have t interval day one here, the easy choice of the binning. Cross-classified random, the base stuff and then thinning because we want to avoid high autocorrelation. Perhaps it should be even a higher thinning, thinning equals 100, which would slow it down further. But in any case, um, this is a harder thing to estimate and therefore you may need to thin, that is skip, uh, not use, only use every tenth draw, or every tenth iteration 
in the uh, Bayesian iterations to describe the posterior distribution of the parameter estimates. So we're going to use the IRT style of loading equality, setting the factor metric on the subject level. And what do I mean by that? Well, cross-classified factor analysis within, between subject, between day. So within, you say negative affect underscore within is measured by, that continuous latent variable is measured by these uh, 10 items that have been declared categorical. So this says then that those items have a probit regression on this continuous latent factor, right? There are indicators of it, which means they have probit regression on to the factor. The factor is the so-called x variable here then. And we hold all of those factor loadings free for reasons that will become clear. And we define the factor with lag one. And after that, space, and then we give labels, parameter labels one through 10, corresponding to the 10 free loadings here. And then we do auto regression of that within factor onto itself, not random at this point, but fixed. And between subjects, we measure the uh, <laughs> negative affect on the subject level by the same uh, items, that is the uh, random intercepts, uh, all free, and we set them equal to the one on the within level, so that lambda between equals lambda within issue. Now we have 10 free factor loadings, so somewhere we have, well, let me just take it further. In, then we have between day variations, so we have negative affect for the time, measured by those same um, random intercepts, but now varying across time and still equal across levels. So this is sort of a cross-level version of the IRT style equality loading. We have 10 free loadings, I began to say, and somewhere we need to set the metric. That is, you can fix the factor variance to one, and I chose to do it on the subject level here. But that, there could be a cottage industry of papers trying to decide where you should set the uh, factor metric and how you should set it, which probably will happen. <clears throat> Runtime for this is 40, 54 minutes on my old computer. Dichotomous, 34 minutes, continuous, 16. You wouldn't want to do continuous. You could imagine dichotomizing it because they're so heavily skewed, each item. But using all the data, as is, 54 minutes. So it's a little slower. Here are the results. One factor for 10 ordinal items. We have to remind ourselves what cross-classified analysis does. So I repeated this equation that we saw before. But now the factor is the uh, dependent variable. So we have the between subject variation, the between time variation, and the within subject variation. And um, the between subject is standardized to one. And the between time is very small. Between uh, within time is very high, much higher than between, between time. And, but still a little bit lower than between subjects. This is probably a typical rank order between them. But even though the variation across time, that is the alpha t variation is fairly small, exciting things happen. You can plot this fact, estimated factor scores for alpha sub t, so alpha hat sub t, across time. So you have the days here up to 56, and the factor score on the y-axis and a time. And you see that the average is zero, but you see that there's a downward trend of that. So it, it says that the factor, the total factor, then has a downward trend thanks to alpha t. And we were at the International, Math International Meeting of Psychometric Society in the Zurich, Switzerland in July, and got help with some interpretation of this look of this, um, how this looks. It's well known for, uh, from the literature that um, uh, psychological measures, mental psychological measures, mental health measures, have a tendency to, to have a J-shaped form that is high values right away and then dipping down low. It's sort of a reporting phenomenon, which we see here. Then things tend to stabilize here, but then much less reporting of negative affect towards the higher days. 
perhaps due to uh, fatigue of the uh, respondents. I don't know. I mean, I'm just uh, suggesting a story. And so perhaps this underestimates it uh, late in the game, and ha perhaps this overestimates it late in the game. Perhaps we should focus on uh, negative affect values in this time period from day 10 to day 40. That's the kind of reasoning that you get out of a plot like that. So it tells you a little bit about measurement and how measurements should be designed and when they should measure and how long they should measure. You also get the posterior distributions of these factors on within and on between and between time. So within, it's not too far from normal, uh, but it's a little bit skewed. And that's a little bit skewed, but not too, too bad. And that's not too far from normal either. But again, the factor distribution is going to be discussed by Morten Schultzberg tomorrow uh, after lunch.